as you might imagine, it starts with leadership. And so we're going to talk about leadership a bit. Uh, I feel a little bit qualified. Um, I think I've had a manager, at least manager responsibility for the last 35 years. And uh, I have a number of anecdotes I could share with you about how uh, it's been impressed upon me that the success of an organization depends on who's running it. Um, I happen to be an Alabama football fan, and I know that Nick Saban has something to do with that team's success. And when teams have problems, they usually change out the coach or they change the manager. They don't fire the players, they fire the coach because the coach has something to do with that team's success. They don't make the basket, they don't make the touchdown, but they establish the environment in which individual success gets translated into team performance. And that's the job of leadership. And, uh, and so it's right, when you change a coach, you're gonna change the team and uh, performance is gonna change. So let's talk about that a little bit. There's three aspects of good leadership that I'm going to talk about that directly connect to safety performance, but as you'll see throughout the day, it connects as well to all the other types of performance that the organization monitors. But the first point, <clears throat> I'm calling it top management engagement. That's a deliberate choice of phrase. A lot of people put top management commitment and then they don't really talk about what it means to be committed. But I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about what it means to be engaged. We've talked about employee engagement. That's another buzzword if you follow HR stuff. But I'm talking about top management engagement and what that means, and that's so vital for success of an organization. So we'll talk about that, and then the next piece is what I'm calling a culture of commitment. And we kind of understand, and if you've read any about safety performance, you know that there are, there are highly performing cultures, there's highly performing safety cultures. Well, I wanna to try to pick out because we don't have a whole lot of time to talk today. This isn't a whole lecture just about culture. Uh, you could spend a whole day talking about it, but I only have a few minutes. So I tried to pick out the key facets of a company culture that's highly performing. And hopefully that'll give you a sense of what's significant about that and what we need to be striving for in our organizations. And then the final piece, which is necessary, and it's a necessary foundation, but it's not where you start, is a formal system, some methodologies associated with safety performance that are focused on prevention. So we'll get started and we'll start talking about top management engagement. So <clears throat> engagement is driven by the vision and values of the leader. What they think is how they will lead. And what they think is vitally important. And there are certain core things that leaders need to think, need to believe represents reality before they can be effective, especially in the safety domain, but frankly, any other domain as well. Good leaders are characterized by what they have between their ears. And I'm not talking about Wexler's scale of human intelligence. I'm talking about what they believe to be true about the world because that's going to establish the priorities that they set and it's going to be determinative of what they reward or punish in their organizations, what they talk about and what they don't talk about, what meetings they decide to sit in and which ones they blow off because they don't think they're that important. The way we think is going to be reflected in our behavior and people who are trying to please the boss, and by the way, we all try to do that, right? It's a self-preservation kind of thing. It also makes us feel good because we think we're doing a good job when the boss is happy. So my job at NK, of course, I've got to take care of my people, but I also got to make my boss happy. And hopefully there's not a contradiction between those two requirements but I've got to figure out what makes my boss happy and his values and his vision 
for what is true about the world is going to influence my decision making and my managers and my supervisors and finally the people that are out on the floor. So what are those core truths that have to be known? Well, the first is, and I've tried to be pretty and cute, and so I've got a little logo for each one. Maybe it'll help you. My wife is an artistic, creative person, and I'm kind of a numbers guy. So we get along well. We fight really well. <laughs> and uh, compliments, you know, opposites attract and all that. But uh, so she said, you know, what, she looked at this presentation, she said, you, you should put little pictures with these because that would be helpful people to remember them. I don't know if it will or not, but that's why I did it. But anyway, the first thing is regard for human life, our stewardship. We have to put people first, really put people first. We say frequently, oh, uh, our people are our number one asset, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, trucking firm that's uh, on their trailers, it says our most valued asset six, sits 60 feet ahead. You ever seen those on the highway? And they're talking about the driver, right? <laughs> so th that's what we have to believe and have it in our heart as well as our head. If the boss of the company that you operate in does not every now and then mingle with the troops because he likes them, that's a giveaway that he doesn't have human life first. If he sees the business as a machine whose crank gets turned to make money and doesn't think that they're humans actually making the products, if that's not first, then Safety will always be a number two or a number three priority. Important, but not the most important. And that difference is crucial to success. There's nothing that happens in your company without people doing it. Even the machines that make things automatically are tended by humans and whose products are confirmed to be correct by humans. Take the humans out of the factory and nothing happens of any value. They have to be number one. So <clears throat> that's the first. The second truth, a reality, vision, is that all injuries can be prevented. I'll bet there's even some people here that don't believe that that's true. That's a real problem. We have to believe that all injuries can be prevented. You say, some people are just dumb. Some people are going to screw up. So there's, humans are not perfect. Well, <laughs> I'm here to proclaim that there are, there is a combination of circumstances that we can construct so that all injuries can be prevented. And if we don't believe that that's even possible, we will cut ourselves a margin of slack and we will never achieve good performance. We will always allow ourselves the excuse that there's going to be some guys that just get hurt in our business. And that's death to the priority of safety and it sends a message that it's okay for people to get hurt. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's something that we can equate to highly performing safety organizations. Third, we have to have a focus on the problem, not the people. We cannot blame people for our problems. We have to focus on the causes of the trouble. We have to see injuries and incidents, events, near misses, first aids, as opportunities to focus on improving the organization, not on finding out who screwed up. If you were to decide that we're going to fire anyone that got hurt, which would probably be illegal from a labor law perspective, right? 
But if you were to say, you know, there are just some people that are error prone, so let's just get rid of those guys and then we'll have really good safety performance. You would very soon whittle away your population to very small numbers. Finally, you wouldn't have anybody who's willing to work for you because they're all humans. That's the raw material from which we draw our workforce and we have to deal with it. We have to acknowledge going in that sometimes people are gonna forget something, so maybe we ought to figure out a way so that forgetting something doesn't automatically mean they get hurt. On the other hand, we've got to recognize that there's no way in the world that we're going to operate a manufacturing facility without some hazards. But there are ways to protect people from hazards. So the goal is not to create a manufacturing facility where there's no possible way that anybody could get hurt no matter what. We should all be wrapped in foam of a certain thickness and you know have all of our sharp edges covered and make it toddler proof. You know, there's no way we're gonna make products that we can sell in an environment where nobody could possibly get hurt. But a combination of training, culture, process design, product design, and an open culture where we are able to talk about screw ups, mistakes, things that aren't working so that they can be addressed. That's going to drive good performance. And the last thing is, is that we've got to get rid of a compliance mentality. A mentality says, I follow all the rules, therefore I should be okay. If people are really number one, then merely satisfying some faraway government agency should not be our goal, our only goal. The level of satisfaction in our performance should not be, are we following all the rules? Are all our guards in place? Have we got e-stops at the right places? Are our fire exits open? You know, all the things we got to do for OSHA. Are they all good? Okay, well then we're good. Well, what about that guy? What about this? What about this? You know, OSHA can't make rules for all the possible circumstances. There are no OSHA rules that say you can't have a guy lift 75 pounds 100 times a day. We got to care about that. So our vision of reality has to encompass these points. And there they are all together. We've got to have a regard for human life and see that as our primary stewardship. Our primary role is to prosper and care for the people that have been entrusted to us. We don't own them. They have been provided to us as a resource so that we can get some work done. That all injuries can be prevented. We focus on the problem, not on the people. We recognize that safe work is not the absence of all hazard, and yet we strive to have an, an organization where OSHA compliance is the bare minimum. I don't know about you, but I know from having experience with this industry in the past, you guys don't really want additional regulation, right? You would prefer not to have additional rulemaking associated with any aspect of your trailer manufacturing. So, maybe we should strive to have an industry that is better than the norm so that our government agencies point to you as an example rather than a whipping boy. Maybe just for our own industry self-preservation we should be striving to do way better than what those government weenies ask us to do. Okay. This is the way most people see their organizations. And in fact, if you were to pull up their documentation, they might have an organization chart and it's gonna look pyramidal in shape. 
and how many layers and all that might vary from one place to the next. But basically, that's the image of an organization. And your employees have an image of your organization, and if they were asked to draw it, they would probably draw it something like this. There's the big bosses up at the top, and there's not so many of them, and they get paid a lot of money. And I'm here at the bottom with all my buddies, and in between is a bunch of layers of management that tell us what to do. That's the way people see their organization. And what I'm asking you to do is to think about your organization upside down. Now, here's why I say that. I'm an executive. I'm, I'm actually now in the pointy end of that thing. And you know what? If I do my job correctly, I feel the weight of responsibility of all those people on me. Now, I'm not the president. He's at the really pointy end. And he makes the big bucks and has the authority and ability because he's got the entire organization hinging on him. And by the way, that's unstable equilibrium, right? The top guy, he screws up, the whole organization can shift. It's true. You know a company called Tesla? You know that guy that's in charge? He does some weird things. All of a sudden, that whole organization, every, what everybody thinks about that organization, internally and externally changes. The executive's job is to take care of, to hold up the next layer of management and to communicate their sense of responsibility and stewardship to that next layer. And that middle layer, those middle layers are supposed to do the same thing. So that everybody is holding up the guys that actually produce the things that make us money, which is the guys at the top. There's a lot of them. And it takes a lot of work to make sure that they are properly equipped, properly trained, properly resourced, properly set in an appropriate job for their skills and ability so that they can be, in combination, successful at producing a very complex product. If we think of our job, if we think of management like the upside-down triangle, it changes our perspective on what our job is and how we earn money. All those people, except the gray ones at the top, they don't make anything that they can sell. They're there to make sure that the top layer is able to do their job more effectively and efficiently. Otherwise, why pay them? So, we have a responsibility to share our stewardship with the middle layers. And the things that we talk about in terms of vision and values have to be passed on to that next layer and that next layer because my supervisors, when they talk to operators, they represent me and management and what management thinks. Because they're as close to management as they're gonna get most days. And if the supervisor says, you know, all that crap they've been hearing, you know, you heard about in that big meeting, you know, don't worry about that. That's a problem, right? We all got to be working together to hold those people up. Consider the situation of our folks with respect to our management and leadership engagement. Our people have nothing except what we provide. Look at that list. We give them all those things. And yet, when somebody screws up, who do we immediately want to blame? Where is our incident investigation focused? What did Ralph do? You know, I pick on Ralph. I actually have my, my next door neighbor when I was growing up. His name was Ralph, and he, he and I were best buds. And uh, we went, lived through a lot of exciting times together. And uh, anyway, so I pick on Ralph. But anyway, he's the, he's the Joe, you know, John Doe. He's the everyman. So what happens when Ralph fails? 
And, and who's at fault when Ralph gets hurt? Is it Ralph or is it me? Given the situation in life that I have placed, Ralph. It's me. When I took over, my, I, I was a quality and engineering guy for NK, and they said, you need to show us that all that quality stuff can actually be turned into a workable factory, so we're going to give you the opportunity to be the plant manager. And that was very scary for me, because I didn't really think I wanted to be a production guy. And uh, I had no concept of what it was like to be a production guy, other than being a factory worker. When I was going through college, I worked for my dad, which I don't recommend, by the way. Maybe some of you are in family businesses, but my dad wanted to prove there was no favoritism at all, so I got all the dog jobs. But anyway, um, so other than being a factory worker, I did not know my dad was a supervisor um, in, a, in a shop that made boxes, cardboard boxes. Maybe some of you buy them today. They're called Fellows Manufacturing. It used to be called Banker's Box. Anyway, he retired from there a long time ago. But point is, so I didn't have any experience. And here I am, the plant manager, and I'm trying to institute quality stuff and whatever. And so I asked my boss, who gave me this grandiose responsibility, so can you give me some pointers? You know, like, I'm humble here. I don't know what I'm doing. You just gave me a big job. And, and here's what we're going to do. Brand new technology. Half the people were going to be brand new, out, out, you know, for hired off the street. And the other half were going to be people from the old factory. And that it was going to start out with new technology. And I got half new guys, half guys that don't know the technology but think they know how to make these products. It is a disaster in the making. So I asked my boss, you got any tips? That's what he told me. He said, your job is to make sure that your people have what they need to be safe and successful. That's it. That's it? No, no fancy plant? I mean, there's probably whole college courses on plant management. That's all you're going to give me? Yeah. Okay. So I started out my first day. So I thought, okay, uh, what do I do? I, I'm going to have a meeting with all my people. And, uh, I, you know, we're going to make the best products and we're going to follow quality rules and we're going to make this high technology stuff work and, you know, here's our plan for starting up. And so I finished my little dog and pony show and somebody in the back says, so uh, I got a question. Okay, uh, what is it? Um, you know, we set up this cafeteria and there's vending machines, but there's no change machine. Can you think you can get me a change machine? That was the response, you know? And I'm like, okay, so my boss said what they need to be safe and successful. So maybe if I get them a change machine, which was fully within my power to do, they'll think that when they talk, I'm listening. So the next day, I figured out a way to get the vending machine company to haul in a change machine, and I got my first thank you. That is caring for people and paying attention to what they need. It doesn't have to be fancy, but you got to care for what people thought, you know? I wasn't going to make any more wheels per hour by having a change machine. But I communicated something to that guy that day. And that's what we got to do. And by the way, you can't have meetings every day where you have that kind of interaction. So what do you got to do? You got to spend time on the shop floor intermingling with folks so that they're comfortable enough talking to the big dogs so that you can find out what they really need. That's part of the problem with big management, right? Is they're so insulated from real people, they don't have a clue what's going on, what real life is like, how hard it actually is, what day-to-day -day struggles are about. But we've got to have top management engagement so that they understand that Ralph likes coon hunting, something I have no idea how to do, but I heard a lot about when I was on the shop floor. 
I don't hunt, I don't fish, I don't do any of the things that my guys really like to do, but I heard a lot about it and I learned to ask at least halfway reasonable questions so that they thought I did. And then when I asked them, hey, how's it going? They might feel free to tell me that this or that part number was having a problem because of this or that or the other thing or this machine's been acting up or this little situation over here we can't get fixed or whatever. And those are the things I can take concrete action on and make improvements. We've got to have leadership engagement. And I know that in some places, even supervisors don't go out on the floor. Our supervisors have to talk to every employee every day, at least to say, hi, how you doing? To have some kind of a conversation with them because they're the people that are important. That's what's important. Okay. So, we demonstrate engagement, wrapping up this little piece, the top part of the triangle. We demonstrate engagement by our personal presence, eye-to-eye -eye contact, touching, putting a hand on a shoulder every now and then, verbal support, encouraging, thanking people for doing what they're doing every day faithfully, even if it isn't outstanding. You do remember they're the ones making the money for the company, right? We should be thankful for that. I don't know about you, but I don't assume that everybody's going to come to work every single day. <laughs> you know, we should expect that, right? That's part of your job. But, you know, in these days, in this economy, in this labor force, you know, we should be thanking people just for being faithful. It's hard to get out of bed sometimes. And they do it for you every day. And yes, we should pay them their fair wage, but we should be thanking them. We should be part of their lives. We spend enough time with them, right? They're there eight, ten hours every day, more time with us than their spouses. We demonstrate engagement by how we spend our resources. That's not just money, and it's not just time, it's stuff. We take priority action on metrics. We actually care about what the numbers say, and we prioritize work on it. And we hold people accountable. Helping the shop floor see that the top guy is holding the middle level responsible for the bottom level's welfare is the best thing you can have happen. It's like this place works, you know? Like the top guy, what he says, it's really important, and he's watching out for me. That process has got to be somewhat visible. No, I don't want to have me seen shooing out a supervisor in front of these workers. That's stupid, and that's bad, and it embarrasses people. But if I have a supervisor that's really crappy at dealing with people, and I see that that's happening, and I don't do anything about it, guess what? That looks like that's me. Okay? Management doesn't have a clue what's going on down here. But when they see that guy changed out for somebody that's a little more compassionate, oh, I guess that matters. And that word filters around. And it takes time. But we, we've got to have that kind of engagement and visibility and openness. And we need to show compassion for the injured. When people get hurt, especially when they made a mistake, they feel bad about that, right? I can't tell you. I, 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 I'd get choked up if I, if I talked about the image of Scott in the hospital bed, the guy that got burned and I talked about earlier, and I'm talking to him, and he's apologizing to me over and over again. His hand is all covered completely with the gauze and bandages and stuff, and he's got an IV hooked up, and he's almost crying apologizing for having done this because he knew that he made a mistake. And, and what am I supposed to do then? I'm supposed to chew him out? 
I'm supposed to discipline him and write him up because he screwed up? No, I'm supposed to show compassion. I'm supposed to accept the blame of his sister. I'm supposed to strive to do better. I'm supposed to help everybody learn from this so it doesn't happen to anybody ever again. But how many of us, somebody gets hurt, and maybe it's not so bad that it puts them in the hospital, but somebody gets hurt and they get a write-up. I'm going to talk a little bit later about what a just culture is. Somebody makes an honest mistake, it's an honest mistake. Should we punish people for making honest mistakes? I don't know about you, but I've forgotten a few things in my life. I've actually I changed job and I start going out the driveway and I go the wrong way because I'm, I'm supposed to go the other way now. I'm not, I, I made a mistake, you know? Did somebody write me up for that? Because I'm a human? No. What if I do it twice? I don't know about you, but I've made more than one mistake, even of the same kind before. We've got to figure out where the line is between what we apply discipline to, what we apply coaching, counseling, and actual encouragement to. But that's another slide. Okay. So, we're going to talk about a culture of commitment. That's the middle piece in the triangle. And the middle piece in the triangle, I'm going to d describe it first by showing you what normally happens in an organization and then what probably ought to happen, all right? So here's how it works in some places. And if you relate to this, you can just keep it to yourself. I don't want to know. But follow me along. So a compliance is observed, and uh, we... we, uh, we point of finger, and, uh, and we call it counseling. In, in, in my company, we have a thing called a oral, uh, oral written warning. It goes in their file, but it's not supposed to actually count, but if you get a lot of them, then it does, kind of one of those things. So, but, but they get written up, because they didn't follow a rule, or they didn't do something right, or whatever, and so they get written up. And, uh, when that happens, they know that that was an honest mistake, or they were trying to make us happy by taking that shortcut, and now they get whacked. I, th I, th I thought it was important to get that other trailer out, so I did this, and yeah, I slipped and fell, and I broke my leg, but, you know, I I'm just trying to make you happy, buddy. What do you want? Now you're writing me up. So what ends up happening, whether they verbalize that or not, is that trust is eroded. Because you're talking out of one side of your mouth, but acting out of the other. Okay? So when trust is eroded, then people don't talk to you the same way. In fact, sometimes they just don't talk to you at all. They would rather not have any interaction with their supervisor. And what happens when that takes place is that you lose a really valuable source of information. Namely, what's actually happening on the shop floor and what kind of problems are being observed, and what kind of workarounds people have figured out to do, which may or may not be on the process sheet, they may or may not be safe, but they don't want to tell you because you've already proved yourself unfaithful and talking out of both sides of your mouth. Well, that means that things don't improve and they're going to happen again. And we develop these things that uh, the, the term error traps is kind of developed, and I'll show you a slide of what I mean by that, but these issues fester on the shop floor, and that's going to lead to another injury, and then the cycle repeats, and it gets worse, and sometimes it happens to fall multiple times on the same guy, and then you finally terminate him because you can't follow the rules. That is a culture of compliance. It's rule-based. It's not people-based, and it doesn't have a commitment to people. It has a commitment to following the rules and doing objective things that run roughshod over human beings. But that's how safety works in a lot of places. And I'm not saying that following rules is bad. I'm saying that you have to acknowledge the fact that human error exists. And you've got to be more compassionate to people than that. 
And if you want reasonable but mediocre performance, you just do that all day. And by the way, you're always chasing your tail, right? You're looking for blips, and you're whacking them. So you know the game, right? Whack a mole, you got a bunch of holes, and every now and then something pops up and you're supposed to hit it. That's the way the game is played in safety. And by the way, same thing is true in quality. If you don't get information up front so that you can take care of it before it gets to be a big problem, and you blame the people, the, the people that are failing to follow the rules. Here's a list of error traps, things that develop when there's poor communication to management about real life. So you just, you, the process engineers, the product design people, it turns out this operation ends up with you know, seven things to do and they only got this much time to do it and they add one more thing and so you know, prudence goes out the window. And nobody knows about it because they make it work on the floor. Because they're trying to make us happy. But every day there's risks. The guy's, you know, not even taking time for the saw to quit rotating before he's flinging it down and doing something else. Distractions and interruptions in processes and frustration with the job builds up. We multitask to the point where people forget stuff. We build complacency because if they don't care about me, I don't care about them, I don't care about the job, I'm just here to get it done so I can get out of here. We create peer pressure situations. Get the story. A mountain of human error. Here's how it could work. Here's how I recommend it work. So you're going to see mistakes. That's just the nature of the human condition, right? Ah, crap. There we go. Come on. There we go. Um, so somebody gets hurt. Uh, my first step is, hey, are you, do are you feeling okay? Everything okay? Hey, let me take care of that. Let's get that taken care of. What can I do? Need to get home? I can give you a ride. We try to take care of the guy. We console him. We recognize that he's not ultimately at fault. We're human. We're compassionate. When we do that, we build trust. Hey, he's not such a bad guy. He took care of me. He didn't blame me for what I was trying to do for the company when it didn't work out the way I planned. When you improve trust on the floor, you get better communication. That guy, you've made a friend. Maybe not a lifelong friend, maybe not somebody you share your problems at home with, but somebody who can trust you enough that he can talk to you about what's going on at work. And when you have that increased communication, you have greater awareness of what's going on on the floor, and you can address risk. And that means that you start addressing the causes of human error, which builds a virtuous cycle, not a vicious cycle. And a focus on commitment. And what is the commitment? It's the commitment to human beings demonstrated by our initial response to an incident that drives this inherently proactive relationship. That's what we want to do. That's what the middle part of the triangle is about. If you don't have the top management engagement, this effort will fall because we will decide that other things are more important than safety. But if you've got top management engagement, then you can promote this activity 
at the supervisory and manager level and improve the situation on the shop floor to the point where people are coming to you with issues and problems and troubles, and that's what your supervisors ought to be engaged in, is making the shop floor environment better because we want to make people productive and efficient, and to do that, we make them safe and quality-minded. The bottom of the triangle is formal systems that are focused on prevention, that support the top two pieces of this pyramid. So we need to be able to talk about safety, and so everybody, shop floor associates, all the way through the organization, need to know what the numbers mean. If you talk about TCIR and DART and LCAR and nobody else knows what those mean, it's kind of gobbledygook, you know? How does it relate to me? What can I do to make them numbers different, you know? So we've got to help translate, and we've got to help people understand how we're measuring performance. So we have a common language to talk about safety. What is a near miss? What's a recordable? You know, all that kind of stuff. We've got to translate our compliance things, our OSHA rules and codes and standards that have to be built into our products, and translate those into instructions and clear direction for people so they can follow it. The system of managing a facility is largely about taking the requirements of the customer, which includes government and all the things that you want to have built into that trailer, and translating it so that everybody knows what to do so that that choreography can take place and put a unit out that runs on the road correctly. <clears throat> the operating procedures need to address safety risk as they write things, as they plan. Okay, at this station, these are the things that are going to get done. Okay, just take a step back. What, in what ways could people get hurt in that? doing that work. How hard is that going to be for an actual person to do? I don't know about you, but I hire a lot of young engineers. They're really smart at mechanical engineering. They need to have a little time on the floor to find out what real life is like. Okay? You're asking that guy to pick that casting up and move it from here to here? You try it for a while. Do it just an hour and tell me if that's a good idea. How many steps is that that you figured out? That's crazy. Oh, I, I didn't, I, you know, need, they don't even have a frame of reference. You know? So we need to build safety into our process instructions, help our young engineers appreciate that. And then our system should include an element of audit to verify that our procedures are being followed, not just our compliance regulations met, but our own internal procedures are being followed, because they're going to be a whole lot stricter, hopefully. Okay. And of course, we're going to report on those, the performance of those audits, because that's an early warning sign. Everybody understand the difference between leading metrics and lagging metrics? You know, I, when I drive the car, I do look in the rearview mirror occasionally. It's kind of important every now and then. But I don't drive the car by looking in the rearview mirror. You can't drive safety by knowing what happened in 2017. We can't decide as an industry that we're going to improve and we're going to watch those metrics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Frankly, you're going to always be a year and a half behind. So we got to develop some leading metrics, some things that are indicative of the performance that will result. we got to know what drives those numbers and monitor those things. And audit results, number of nonconformities in audits, safety audits, quality audits, procedural audits, that's indicative of safety performance. If we're not following the rules, or they can't be followed because the rules are stupid, that means there's more risk in the organization, which means we're going to have more injuries and incidents. 
right? So following that will give us a much faster feedback loop to work on than waiting for the Bureau of Labor Statistics in November to come out with the 2018 data. We want to work on corrective action, correction, and focus that on the root cause. We're going to talk about that. We need to, as we indicated a few times now, integrate safety and have a system that's based on some professional competence. There is a body of knowledge that safety professionals should have. There are safety certifications that help them have a broad exposure, a professional exposure to the technical side of safety. It's not what I'm talking about today, but it's really important to understand that aspect. So, <clears throat> with a culture of commitment, here's the elements to summarize. We console human error. We coach at risk behavior. And we punish reckless behavior. So, HR people, they want to know, okay, so you just slammed me because I issue disciplinary warnings and write-ups for people that don't follow the safety rules. So what do you want me to do anyway? Well, we look at an incident. If somebody made a bonehead mistake, an unintentional human error, I'm sorry, people are gonna do that. And so those people get consoled, they get comforted. We feel sorry for them, we help them, we are compassionate towards them because they just exercised the prerogative of being a human. And we work hard to make errors of that type less likely by error-proofing our operations, by guarding them, by protecting them in such a way that human error doesn't hurt them, because it's going to happen. But our job is not to beat up the, the guys that have human error. But when people take risks, that they know are risky behavior. Now we want to coach, and we want to drive the right values into those people so that they appreciate the fact that their human life is very important to us, not just to them. That their own life is at risk, and they should take that as a priority, just like we do. My safety guy if sees somebody without a safety glasses on. He says, do you think for a minute that I care so little about your life that I shouldn't chew you out right now? You know you're supposed to be wearing your safety glasses. They're up here protecting your forehead. I'm going to stop you about that. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to coach you because that's at-risk behavior. That's blowing off a priority that I think is really important around here. That's culture. Culture is the thing you tell the new guy about how to get along. It's what people think are important, right? You can almost sense it when you walk into a factory. We want to coach, and coaching is the opportunity to communicate our vision and values from the top guy and to help people not take risks because they understand the priorities and the dangers. But those people that do the wrong thing deliberately because they want to, because they've made a deliberate decision about it, because they know they had an alternative but they chose to do something else, those we have to punish. That's righteous punishment. See, we've got to balance compassion and accountability in our companies if we care about humans. If we don't care about humans, Forget the compassion piece. You don't get paid for that. But if we care about humans, we're going to balance a need for compassion, a need to have everybody think in the same way, a need to have a culture that is just. And when we treat people this way, the deliberate violators get nailed. The people that make bonehead mistakes and evidence the fact they're human get consoled. And the people that are on the border of those two get coached. If we treat people in that way, then we have a great opportunity to build trust 
and to have a formal system that is consistent with the vision and values that drive good performance in a company. These are a couple people that talk about these things. Um, I don't know Sydney Decker personally, but I've read most of the books in that stack. 